Thank you, thank you very much. I need this chair because at some stage I will need to sit down. I have a very bad uh, knee. Uh, uh, why do I change this? How do you mean? I mean, if, if how to change the slide. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, you, you, you will need to, to show me here. Just use the, the down button. Okay. The down button. Yeah, it goes down. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yes. All right. You know, that's that, that, that's easy. Mm -hmm. Actually, I I decided to use this PowerPoint because I have some paintings that I want to share with you, which are part of of my talk here. And it's always best, you know, when we are actually looking at the painting itself. So I thought, well, I might as well also use it then for just pictures. <laughs> yeah. I am greatly honored to be invited um, to give a lecture named after the three founders of Negritude, Leopold Senghor, uh, Amy Césaire, and Leon I grew up in the 1950s and 1960s when debates sparked by the writings of these intellectuals were raging. We in the south of Africa lived under British rule and then later under apartheid both of which were rooted in segregation rather than the assimilation policies of the French, uh, of French colonialism that this philosophy uh, was protesting. However, elements of it resonated with us, especially its pan-Africanism and its expression of a humanism that positioned black people within a global community of equals. Even from their student days, these founders aimed at breaking nationalistic barriers. Initially, among black students in France, and on a broader scale among Africans in Africa and its diaspora. The breaking of nationalistic barriers resonated with me, for I am a crosser of borders, literally and literarily. Now, as an aside, I want to say that life within borders has ideological and hegemonic implications. It is even more so when borders are crossed, whether literally or literarily. But issues of ideology and hegemony are outside the scope of my talk today. I'm just mentioning it so do you know that I'm aware that, you know, um, there is such. My, my presentation on the creative process is that of a writer, uh, and an artist, rather than a critic or a literary scholar. It is important to make this distinction because our methods are different. The method of you scholars is disjunctive. That is, you take things apart in order to study you know, how those different parts function. Whereas my method as an artist, as a writer, 
is conjunctive. In other words, I bring unlikely things together. It's those unlikely things that you take apart. You see, you take apart what I've brought together. Um, so I bring unlikely things together, maybe from memory or from imagination. But then, as we well know, the line of demarcation between memory and imagination is often blurred. For we imagine from what we know. Sometimes what we don't know, we know. What we don't remember, we know. Uh, <clears throat> so some of the unlikely things that we bring together come from other texts. Whether we remember them or not. Why is it not moving now? Oh, there. Oh, here I just wanted to, to say that I, 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 I think I skipped that part. That I was born in South Africa, but then it, it was when I was talking about crossing borders. Um, uh, in South Africa, you know, in the south then, but then at 15 I was exiled. Um, I was exiled uh, to Lesotho to join my father in exile, and we lived there. For, for many years as, as refugees. You see, Lesotho was a British colony at the time, um, whereas South Africa was, um, was an apartheid state. From 1948, it was officially a, an apartheid state. So many activists, political activists, had to, to escape, and many of them found refuge in Lesotho. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, since then, I wanted to also state that I've crossed many, many uh, borders in Africa, in Europe, and the Americas. And tonight, I want to talk about another kind of crossing, a literary crossing namely intertextuality. That is um, what my talk uh, aims to be about. Um, now, I was also talking about bringing unlikely things together. And some of these unlikely things, as I say, come from other texts. And sometimes we do not even know or remember these texts. Texts, as I say here, know each other. Even texts that never met know each other. But I think first then I need to, to define what I mean exactly by intertextuality. I'm talking here of the relationship between literary texts, or more aptly, the shaping of a text, of a text meaning by another text. Now, this is, is a very rightly uh, a definition, and it asserts that literature does not exist beyond intertextuality. Texts know each other. Even texts that never met know each other. You'll see what I mean by this. 
One of my novels uh, titled The Heart of Redness In fact, this is one of my early novels that I wrote when I went back to South Africa after an exile of more than 30 years. The Heart of Redness is a historical novel. It is set in the 1850s and is based on historical events that happened among the Xhosa people. The Xhosa people, or Amakosa, live in the Eastern Cape of South Africa. Now, it happened among the Xhosa people during the period when British colonialism was taking root in that part of Africa. The British were conquering more and more land from the closer people. A prophet came up, a prophetess, a teenage girl from amongst the Amakosa people, who prophesied that the Kosa people must kill all their cattle and ban all their fields. And when they've done that, on a certain date, the dead would arise. They would come up from the graves and bring new cattle and new, new crops, you know, new um, fresh harvest. It so happened that during that period in the Eastern Cape, there was lung disease and many cattle were dying of this disease, which had come with the British uh, 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 from England. And as a new disease, they did not know how to deal with it. And obviously the new cattle then that would come with uh, this resurrection would be free from this disease. So many people believed uh, this prophet. And there was another one who joined her. Her name was not Naose. Another one called Nongosi, who was also a teenager. I think they were in their mid-teens, or Nongosi was even in her early teens, 13, 14 or so. Now, this was a religious movement, in fact whereby quite a few people uh, followed these prophetesses. There were yet others who refused to follow the prophetesses, which created a civil war among the closer people between the believers and the unbelievers, those who believed the prophecies and those who did not believe the prophecies. Many of the unbelievers thought that Sir George Gray, who was the governor of the Cape at the time, in his attempt to defeat the Corsas, planted this idea in these girls, these prophetesses, this idea of this uh, resurrection. Now, my novel then, you see, looks at that situation in the past and those conflicts between the believers and the unbelievers. But in fact, my novel is about the present, the post-apartheid South Africa. Because we shuttle between the past and the present, looking particularly at contemporary conflicts that involve mostly uh, the preservation of the environment, the fauna and the flora and so on, against those who are bent on, um, on destroying it, you know, by mining and other activities like that. 
Now, the heart of redness then um, examined those issues using the past to examine the present. And it generated a lot of debate and a lot of scholarship as well. Um, and if you, you look at the scholarship, a lot of it, in fact, you see, looks at intertextuality between heart of darkness and the heart of redness. A lot of these scholars will tell you that heart of, um, of redness is a response or talks to heart of darkness uh, in, the, in the way that a lot of, uh, of post-colonial texts are supposed to be speaking back you know, to, um, to the colonial era and colonialism and so on. So this is one of the books then that um, are supposed to be talking back to this particular uh, uh, Joseph Conrad uh, text, Heart of Darkness. But then these two texts never met at all. That's why I'm saying that discourses meander through the centu centuries, leaving their tra traces in texts. And these are two texts that never met. They never met particularly because when I wrote Heart of, of Redness, I had not read Heart of Darkness. In fact, up to now, I've not read Heart of Darkness. Now, you'll wonder, how come uh, this professor has not read uh, Heart of, of, of Darkness? Well, where I come from, is, is it has not been canonized. You can go through your whole education without reading Heart of Darkness. <laughs> you, 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 you see that? It, 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 it is not regarded as one of the, those great canonical texts. Even to hear about Heart of Darkness, it was through Chino Achebe. If Chino Achebe had not mentioned it, it's very likely that I would not have known of this text. I, uh, maybe I would have discovered it only when I come to America here, you know, where it is supposed to be one of the canonical uh, uh, works. You see. Now, how then did I come to, 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 to name this, uh, this book, Heart of Redness, The Heart of Redness. This was by mere chance. Actually, this was not my title. I didn't give it this title. My original title was Ululence, from to ululate. Because in the story there, you know, there are people who ululate and that has some big effect on the events that follow. So my title was Ululens, and I sent it to my publisher, Oxford University Press, with that title. Now the editors there told me that, well, we don't think people will, 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 will like this title or even understand what it means exactly. It's a very strange word. We don't think it will sell the book. That's what the publisher said. Think of another title. So one day I was sitting in a bar with a group of friends of mine having a drink. Then I was sharing with them the problem that I was having that, you know, I have this novel with, with these guys and they don't like my title. Now, one of the guys there called Kifue, who had read the manuscript, said, hey, why don't you call it the heart of redness? Because in the story, of course, you know, it is about actually the, the heart of redness in the closer language when they talk meaning the center of redness, um, which, they, which 
by which they mean the center of backwardness, taking it from the red ochre that um, the non-Christian tossers used to, as a cosmetic, I mean, used to decorate their, their bodies with. So redness then in the closer culture was associated with backwardness. And that is where the title came from. And that's why this guy was suggesting Heart of Redness. I said, yeah, well, I think we'll go with that title then. Little did I know that the, that the title itself then will then, you know, generate all that scholarship of intertextuality between heart of darkness and uh, the heart of redness. That is what I mean when I say these two texts never met. They would have met, of course, if I had read um, heart of darkness. But because I had not read, you see, these two texts never met. But then, Am I saying that that scholarship then is, 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 is not valid? Not at all, in fact. Because intertextuality happens even amongst texts that never met. That is why I'm saying discourses meander through the centuries, leaving traces in texts. And therefore, even texts that never met, they, 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 they there are possibilities of having intertextuality uh, between or among them. That is why then that scholarship that has gone into great detail on how I was responding to Heart of, uh, heart of, of, of Darkness is quite valid. Discourses meander through the centuries leaving their traces in text. Now, what is interesting about this case is that the whole scholarship is as a result of something that is paratextual, by which we, we mean, when we talk of, 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 of paratextuality, of paratextual elements, that lie on the threshold of the text, which helps uh, to control and direct the reception of the text. Elements such as title, such as, you know, um, um, I'm the title of the book, the, the, the chapter titles, and so on. That's what a paratext is. But in this case, in fact, this was a peri text elements such as titles, chapter titles, prefaces, and notes, and so on. In the heart of redness, as in any text, there is a lot of intertextuality. Intertextuality that I am aware of and I am conscious of. Unlike this one that I was not aware of. Um, for instance, Jeff Pierce, the dead will arise. Now, how I came to write The Heart of Redness? I was commissioned by a television production company to write a story on Nongause, one of those two prophetesses, the main one, the bigger one. And then um, I then drove to the place where these people used to live and where miracles are supposed to have happened. You will know about these miracles if you read The Heart of Redness or if you read The Dead Will Arise. Now, Jeff Pierce then was my consultant for that television um, a production, but then it became so interesting for me that I decided that, well, I must expand this into, into a novel. And obviously then he became my main source for the history that I was writing about. 
because in the dead will arise. He researched extensively this history of the Khosa people and of the cattle killing movement, as it was called at the time, the cattle killing movement. And so he was my main source in as far as history. But another intertextuality that I was conscious of was another novel called, uh, well, it's called The Wrath of the Ancestors. It's actually a closer, in, in the closer language, um, it, 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 it's titled Ingumbo Yeminyanya, Ingumbo Yeminyanya. That's a, a closer la, a, a, a novel by A.C. Jordan, which was then translated later into English by the author himself. Now, this novel has always been very important in my life because it is the first novel that I ever read as a seven or eight year old uh, uh, boy. It was the first full length novel that I read. And it happens to be about my people, my clan. And indeed, I was named after one of the characters in that book. I realized even as I was reading The Heart of Redness that there is a lot, you know, that even if I was not aware of it at the time, that is reminiscent of the closer version of the wrath of the ancestors. Sometimes as a writer, you don't know who has influenced you or what text has influenced you until a critic points, points it out. Or when you go back, you know, when you go back and you are, you are, you are, you are reading and you, you, you find, you know, echoes of some other writer, perhaps, uh, whose work you have always admired. So definitely then, this was intertextuality that I could understand because I grew up with this novel. And of course, another intertextuality that I also discovered and could understand was with uh, Chinua Achebe's uh, Things Fall Apart. Especially the final chapter of my novel where uh, I talk of pacification. The concept of pacification features here. When I look back, I say, yeah, there are traces of Chinua Achebe here. Because, you know, in, 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 in Things Fall Apart, there, there's quite a lot of pacification and so on. I, I still could have written of pacification without having read uh, Things Fall Apart because that was the policy of the British at the time. You see that? So he was writing about the British in Nigeria. I was writing about the British in South Africa. And they, are, they, they had the same policy, you see? So it was possible. But in this case, I knew that actually, as a high school boy, I read things fall apart. And pacification, as I have it here, does not come directly from the situation, but is Chinua Achebe's influence. So you see how intertextuality works. But then, of course, there was a lot of intertextuality as well that I was not aware of. I've told you already um, that one, you know, which has, was suggested by the two titles and therefore a lot of scholarship um, uh, happened. But some other intertextuality, uh, le le let me first read perhaps the last paragraph of this novel, The Heart of Redness. The very, very final paragraph. I will, I will not put it in any context because that's not important. You know, um, you'll see what, in my view, is important. Oh, this hazy. He is afraid of the sea. 
How will he survive without the sea? How will he carry out the business of saving his people? Kukezwa grabs him by his hand and drags him into the water. He is screaming and kicking wildly. Wild waves come and cover them for a while, then rush back again. Kukezwa laughs excitedly. Hazy screams even louder, pulling away from her grip. No, Mama, no. This boy does not belong in the sea. This boy belongs in the man village. Period. And that's the end. And that's the end of the novel. You see? Now, what has happened then? Here is that man village. That's what, you know, there, there, there's always been the, that question. This boy does not belong in the sea. This belong, boy belongs in the man village. Now, this is how this scene came about. You'll see that, you know, sometimes when you, you write a novel or you write stories, you know, you, you get things from many different sources. Now, it happened one day that I took my wife and our five, five or four or five year old boy to this place, this part of the Eastern Cape. It's called the Wild Coast. That's where the Heart of Redness is set. It was during the period, in fact, when I was writing the Heart of Redness. So I would go to the place where these so-called miracles are supposed to, to have happened. And then, of course, I would sit somewhere there and keep on writing whilst my wife plays in the sea with this boy. So one day my wife was playing with, with, with this boy called Zukile and was dragging him into the water. And there were waves, you know, sometimes there are waves, you know, that come and so on. And the boy screamed. No, Mama, no. This boy does not belong in the sea. This boy belongs in the man village. I thought, hey, these are beautiful lines. That's, in fact, the end of my novel. That's what I thought. And indeed, it became the end of my novel, word for word. You see? These are words that I stole from this boy when he was screaming there. He was playing with the mother. I thought, yeah, these are beautiful words. I'm going to put them in the mouths of my characters. Of course. <coughs> the mother and the boy of about this, the, the, the boy's age, playing in the sea. But in the context of the story now, of the, the composed story, which you will know if, if you read uh, this book. One day, I was at the University of Kansas. There's a scholar there called Byron uh, Caminero uh, Sant'Angelo. Uh, Sant'Angelo is a scholar of intertextuality. He has written extensively on post-colonial post intertextuality. So as a result, he notices small things and all that. So one day he asked me, exactly that final sentence in your novel, this boy belongs in the man village. What does it mean exactly? What is a man village and how is it different from any other village? I didn't have an answer. I didn't know what a man village was. Because we don't call them man villages. This is a village in the Eastern Cape. It's just called a village. So he, he was keen to know, then, why? then I tell him the story. No, in fact, why I don't know what a man village is, even though I wrote it in my book, is because I got these words from my son. 
four or five years old. So his next question was, do you remember what your son was reading during that period? I happen to remember because I packed his books and in fact he had a book there. You see? It so happened that he was reading the Jungle Book. You see that? And in the Jungle Book, of course, which uh, you know, you know, by uh, Rudyard Kipling, uh, who was a Nobel uh, laureate and did a lot of work in South Africa, in fact, uh, a lot of, of, of his writings and in India. And it was later Disneyfied um, in a 1967 animated film and then later again uh, 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 recently. So that's where then this man village comes from. Obviously, it makes sense in that story because there is a man village, there's the animal village. The animals live in the animal village. And then there's that interaction of the animals with, with the people and so on and all that. So they can talk there of the man village. It's only then, then I, you see, there is intertextuality in my novel, that's what intertextuality means, with the jungle book. And I was not even aware of it because it's another book. You know, the, my, my Heart of Redness and the Jungle Book are two texts that have never met because I've never read that one too. But now they've met via this, this boy, you see. So you see, you know, how intertextuality functions. So intertextuality foregrounds interconnectedness and interdependence, not only in written texts, but in modern cultural life in general. The Basutu people have a say. You, have a, you see that that's a young Musutu man holding a shield. They have a saying, um, the Wasutu people, a society, some of whose art is still part of the common festival with no division of labor between the spectator and the creator, performer, have a proverb, Tebe isehelwa hudima engwe. And this means a shield is patterned on another. We build on what has been created by others before us. So much for originality. Now, paintings. Paintings and other arts such as film, music, architecture, and so on, talk to one another just in the same way as these works of literature talk to one another. They talk to one another even when they've never met. It is the same with the other art forms as well. They talk to one another all the time, as well as talking to other arts. Now, one of my novels is, is The Madonna of Excelsior which I wrote many years after uh, The Heart of Redness. It is set in South Africa uh, during the apartheid period and then after apartheid. Uh, during apartheid, there were, there were very strict laws of who you could love and who you could not love. It was illegal for certain people to love one another. They, they would actually go to jail for that. You see, especially if one is black, the other one is white. You see that? Th these were, were crimes in the statutes book, you see. In the same way that 
I think you, you, you used to have here yeah, until uh, not so long ago in Virginia, I, I remember that story, you know, um, and, and all that. Well, in South Africa, they were much, much stricter than, you know, because people did actually go to jail. People were arrested, they were imprisoned uh, for that. Now, I remembered one day that, you know, there was a time when I was at high school, and then I remember there was a story broke out in a small town called Excelsior. Now, Excelsior, um, just indicate to me when you think, I've, I, you know, it's, it's enough. <laughs> yeah? Because I'll just go on and on. Enough. Yeah? All right. <laughs> yeah, just indicate that, hey, time up. Okay. Yes, please. Now, in, in Excelsior then, um, which was a very conservative town, Conservative, of course, in, a, in as far as, you know, the Afrikaner people, Af Afrikaner, uh, the white South Africans uh, who, who were in power at the time. You see, they are descendants of the Dutch and the French Huguenots and so on. But then they evolved. They evolved as a, a, a tribe um, with its own culture that drew from the various mother cultures, but also from the cultures of the slaves. Even their language, Afrikaans, in fact, was a Creole invented by the slave. The slaves who came from different areas to communicate among themselves. So the slave master appropriated that language and it became his language. So that, 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 that was the birth of Africans. So when we talk of Afrikaners, the word means Africans, but they are in fact, um, that white tribe then, which was in power, which introduced statutory apart. I say statutory because uh, racial discrimination in South Africa has always been there. It was introduced by the British, you know, many, many years before the Afrikaners took over, took power. The Afrikaners, the, you know, all, all they did then was to, um, to make these new laws. In other words, to put what was already in practice, or sometimes loosely practiced, because people still did, did marry even, you know, then into very strict laws that had to be obeyed, you know. So in this town then, it so happened that at one stage, the police observed that there were too many biracial children. In South Africa, they're called coloreds, colored children, you see. So the word colored is used differently there uh, from the, the way, than the way you use it here. Uh, colors in South Africa are you know, descendants of those biracial unions of, of centuries ago. So they, they noticed, the police noticed that in this town, even though there's no colored community, in other words, people of who have been biracial from their ancestry, you know. It's just a black community there and a white community. But now all of a sudden there are all these colored kids running around the streets. So they, sus they suspected that uh, somebody was breaking the law there. The law was known as Immorality Act. So it, it was immoral for any black person to have sexual intercourse with a white person. And then they discovered that a lot of the, the, the white men, Afrikaners of that town, were having sex with the black women there, most of whom were their servants and so on. And as a result, they were all these children. And of course, that was illegal. They were all arrested, men and women and so on. And, and there was a case, a very big case, which was publicized all over the world. Why it got that much publicity is because the men involved were not just ordinary white Afrikaner men. They were actually leaders of the ruling party, the very party that introduced those laws, you see. So, well, of course, the case was withdrawn because of the embarrassment that was happening um, and all that. So it happened then many years later in the new South Africa, in the new 
democratic, you know, uh, post-apartheid South Africa, I was curious to know what happened to those children who were born, who would be adults now, of course, you know, uh, uh, who were born during that period. And what happened to the men and to the women? Some of the men actually committed suicide because of embarrassment. Others were pastors in the church and so on. So I went back to Excelsior then to discover this story. And I wrote the novel, The Madonna of Excelsior. It's based on, on that. It's actually based on real people who, who live there. And you'll find here actually clippings from newspapers and so on. So, in this novel then, what I do, so that's the cover, and that other uh, uh, picture is from, is from a play that was based on this novel. Um, um, a play uh, that was performed in South Africa and, and so on. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> what I've done in this book is to use paintings. There's an artist who lives there in that area. Well, he's dead now. He lived there then. Uh, Father uh, Franz Cloud, who was um, a Catholic priest. And he used to paint, you know, he, he, um, he was a Flemish expressionist. Um, I use his paintings because he painted those sceneries and those, you know, my, my whole setting actually, you know, and also the characters, the people there, you know. He, he painted, he, he, he was a very active painter there. So I, I use then these paintings um, to talk to my literary text and direct its development. This is what is often referred to as ekphrasis. Now, ekphrasis is a rhetorical device in which visual, in which a visual object, usually a work of art, is vividly described in words, which is what I do here. Each chapter opens with a painting, but a painting in words, I describe a painting. And then the subjects of that painting emerge from the painting and become characters of my story. So each chapter opens is a painting by Father Fra Franz Clairhout, and then of course uh, these characters then emerge and then, um, and then become uh, characters. Now, wh why did I use paintings to tell this story? On the surface of things uh, is because they were there, as was the artist. And I loved uh, his work. Let me just read one chapter to show you what I'm talking about. When I say chapter, don't be scared. They are very brief. They are very brief chapters. Eh, you see? Let me read one chapter just for you to, to see how this ephrasis works here. It's, it's chapter three titled, All These Madonnas. Never mind about the context. <clears throat> Madonnas all around, exuding tenderness, bent amber mother in a blue shirt, squatting in a field of yellow ochre wheat. 
Bent Sienna baby wrapped in white lace, resting between her thighs. Mother with a gaping mouth, big oval eyes, naked breasts dangling above the baby's head, flaky blue suggesting a hollow, unhampered bonding of mother and child and wheat. Brown Madonnas with big breasts, a naked Madonna lying on a bed of white flowers. Her eyes are closed and her lips are twisted. Her voluptuous thighs are wide open, ready to receive drops of rain. A black pubic forest hides her, her nakedness. Her breasts are full and her nipples are hard. Under her arm she carries a baby wrapped in white lace. A naked Madonna holds naked, a, a naked child against a blue moon on a purple sky. The mother is kissing back, uh, is kissing the back of the child's head, and so on and so forth and so forth. Now, Obviously, this is a painting that I'm describing here. Now, if, if I had the time, I, I would read the rest where you see how then these subjects then walk out of the canvas and become the characters um, of, my, of, my, of my work. In actual fact, why I use the paintings, well, be, besides the fact that they were there and the artist was there, is because they have an immediacy that you do not find in a literary text. A literary text has to unfold over a period of time. But these paintings, of course, you know, the, 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 that's the artist. This artist created this, this world for me. Now, Father, uh, uh, the, 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 this artist was born in Belgium in 1919, but lived in the Free State in South Africa from 1946 till his death in 2006. He was influenced by Flemish ex expressionists. As you'll see when you look at his paintings, these are two of his paintings. Now, if you are familiar with the work of, of uh, Flemish expressionists, You'll see it there. Now, now he cites uh, his strongest influence uh, as one uh, um, was um, a certain artist called Constant Permeke. Well, these are more works by Franz Flahout. And these, you know, are scenes from, from that area that he has rendered in his, you know, um, a Flemish expressionist manner. In the manner of the major influence, his major influence, uh, namely this artist called Constant uh, Permeke, uh, who lived much earlier than uh, Franz Cloud. So those are some of the paintings. Uh, so like Clairhouse, he was concerned with peasants and the land they tended. So you see, that's you know, something in, in common between these two artists. And you will see that they are also concerned with everyday characters doing everyday chores. Big hands and big breasts that Claude admired and reproduced and recreated in his work. But the intertextuality went further than that. As in Permeke, we see in Claude powerful contours, impasto colors, simplified forms um, executed in highly expressive manner, distorted figures in warm colors. 
So, it's amazing that then one is able to trace an ancestry from, from Permeke in the 20s to Tlehot in the 80s to Madonna of Excelsior in 202. Now, another form then of intertextuality that I want to talk about briefly before I'm kicked out of here uh, is that of folklore in what critics call magical realism. You might have heard, you know, uh, if, if you, re you, you read about my work, it's often referred to as magical realism. Now, that's not what I call it myself, because I just tell story, a story. It's, it's not my job to, to label it anything. I leave that to you, scholars and critics. You see? But the sources that I use in my work are the same sources that uh, those magical realists who do what is known as ontological magical realism use. In, you, in, in other words, uh, You see, generally, in magical realism, the supernatural, you know, the, the, the strange, the, uh, the unusual, exists in the same context as objective reality, you know, as empirical reality, without it being disconcerting. In other words, it's taken in a deadpan manner by the characters in the story, and therefore by the reader. There's not the wow factor. How did this happen? You, you, you don't want an explanation. You take it, okay, in this world, this is how things happen. Now, ontological magical realism draws actually from the oral traditions, from folklore and so on. And usually uses, takes that folklore or what in the West would be called superstitions that exist among the people, and then write of it as if it is objective reality. Whereas on the other hand, epistemological uh, magical realism such as that of writers like Vangelis, Hathianidis, the Greek fellow over there, uh, you know, is purely invented magic that's been created from, from I imagination. And in many instances, it, it attempts to subvert science. You know, it, it has some of its roots in science, but it, it subverts that science. Now, ours, then, is the ontological type that is informed by the rich folklore that exists in our communities. That is where we draw. In other words, that's but one of the very rich intertextualities, you know, that come into play in our work. It so happened, in fact, that, um, and you, you, you know one of the major writers, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, in South America, told me once that, in fact, his own magic comes from his own, from his grandmother. You know, the storytelling of grandmothers. And I was amazed to hear that because mine also came from my grandmother, from her storytelling, you see, which was very magical, but at the same time, you know, uh, existing in the same context as our own reality. He further told me that, in fact, his grandmother got her magic from the African slaves in Colombia. So, which was quite amazing for me to see that in fact our source of magic is the same, the African grandmother. Now, I use then a lot of that in my work, and then I'll just rush now because 
we no longer have time. I, I just wanted to share some of the paintings that I do, because you see, as you can see that uh, painting, you know, is, is, is very important in my practice, in my, in, in, in my art, in my writing, but also. Now, this, of course, uh, happened uh, in South Africa uh, in 2012 when miners went on strike because they wanted more money. And then the police came and shot many of them. About 34 miners were killed and 70 were wounded. This is known as the Marigana massacre, which took place then and is regarded as the single most lethal use of force in South Africa. You know, and what, you know, this happens now when it's post up apartheid and black people are supposed to be in, in power. Now, this, this massacre then, there emerged this leader who was called um, Pineni Mambush Noki, you know, who, who, who was an illiterate man who led these mine workers. Noki would negotiate with the police, as you see in that picture, because the police came in their armored vehicles and so on. And there, as you see him there, you know, talking, he would go talk to the police and then go to the miners to try to, to, to calm them down and so on, to pacify them. And then the police opened fire. And Noki was one of the guys who was killed, as you can see him there. Now, he has become a very iconic figure in South Africa. He's referred to as the man in the green blanket. You know, it has become some kind of a matter, a political matter of the new South Africa, you see. When we are no longer killed by the Afrikaners, now we are killed by ourselves. So, I've painted a series of paintings then that are informed by these events. But then, of course, I subvert them uh, and make them and give them, imbue them with new meaning, as you can see the sunflower and other flowers and, and, and so on and so forth. Well, it's up to you what you want to read in that. I'll be very fast now because uh, of time. And then, of course, again there, we see other paintings that are also informed. That's, that's intertextuality as well there, you see. Because I was not there myself when these things happened. They were captured by news people through photographs, through descriptions, and so on. And using those images to create my own paintings. That is another form of intertextuality. Um, I won't read, I wanted to read my artist statement, but there's no time uh, for that, which would explain my method here, but uh, which is a very intertextual method. Again, here, another painting, The Man in the Green Blanket. Now, if you're in South Africa, you would know what those houses are and what they mean. These are the houses of the president, the, the present president, who stole money from the, 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 the state to, to build some of these houses. And then, of course, you know, he, he, he was required, he was taken you know, to the public uh, protector and so on, and to court and all that. He was required to pay back some of that money, and he has. But then, of course, the man in the green blanket haunts him and, and his types, you know, uh, in my work, as you, you can see here. And, of course, that's a semi-abstract uh, uh, painting, but also, you know, with that theme, uh, another rendition of the man in a green blanket. Here, using also the Basutu um, in intertextuality with Basutu wall decorations, um, which are known as Ditima or the Patroni. That's another semi abstract, and of course, another painting there, the man in a green blanket. Uh, it's up to you what you make of it. If we had time, I would uh, elaborate on, on some of this. 
the men in the green blanket also. So it's a whole series of paintings that I've done about the men in the green. That's another one. Well, I no longer own this one. It's with, it's with a collector uh, in England. It's also, it's influenced also a lot, as we can see, by cubism, you see, uh, Brax uh, cubism. Um, and that's the same abstract word. This one is, is, on, is, is on dance, because dance also, you know, resonates with me. That's another one there. Um, Matosini is a very famous uh, traditional singer and all that. And this is the washboard series, which then is, you know, mostly set here. You can see some of the figures are three-dimensional figures. The washboard, the shoe, and so on. You know, there are three-dimensional figures that I put there and paint around them. That's intertextuality. Collage, in fact, is intertextuality. Because you get text from different uh, places. Each text has its own meaning, where it comes from. Then you bring them together to create new meaning, to imbue them with new meaning. That's another uh, 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 washboard text. And this one, my very favorite, I've refused to sell this one. Many people, you know, because this is in my gallery and then many people want it. Uh, I, I'm very attached to it, but I don't know why. I think that's the end. I, I, I will end here. Thank you very much. Oh yeah, questions, all right. Thank you so much for your, your wonderful remarks. I think you, you were too humble when you, you said that you're just a writer and not a scholar or a critic. It seems like you have the virtues of, of the writer, the scholar, and the critic all together in, in your lecture. Oh, thank you. Uh, I, I wonder, um, I, I don't have a well-formed question, but, but I'm thinking about um, uh, intertextuality and in institutions. Uh, and uh, how the growth of, uh, say, MFA programs uh, changes the possibility for, for the contingency and chance, which I, I think you, you, your presentation emphasized how yes. the, the contingency and chance is what makes um, the beauty grow out of the intertextuality. It's not just copying, right. it's not just refusing, but th th there's something about the green blanket or the, the words of the sun that you know, uh, uh, allow for the, the beauty of, the, of the, the artwork to to emerge. And I wonder if MFA programs sort of hold that back, right, uh, sort of uh, constrain it when there's a canon, right, that, that, that's sort of fixed. Uh, and um, uh, whereas the, the kind of, uh, <coughs> you know, uh, emergence that you're describing of your own uh, uh. literary career allows for that in a certain way. So I, I guess I also wonder, in the political context of South Africa, I mean, the, the minor strike seems like one example where, where there's that possibility for, for new emergence, whereas I wonder what your thoughts are on the... The, the know, MFA as well. Uh, fees must fall, or roads, roads must uh, fall, right? I mean, the, the, the kind of um, uh, activism around academic institutions in South Africa, yes. as opposed to labor-centered labor, labor -centered activism, seems like the academic-centered activism might be more institutionalized in a way that, that could be... Well, I, I mean, you, you see, uh, I... I support all those activisms because even those students, you see, they didn't just suck this from, from their thumb. They were promised these things. When we wanted them to vote for us, when Mandela himself, he wanted their votes, he made promises. There will be free education for all. You here who are here, you'll all get houses. You see? And I warned him even then that you are creating expectations that you will not be able to, to fulfill. Now, young people are holding them to those promises that they made, you see? And now they, they have no way out. You see, they have no way out, they just have, because the young people are putting a lot of pressure, you see? And the young people, they know already that if the young people made apartheid ungovernable, they can also make us ungovernable. <laughs> you see that? Yeah. About MFA and so on, I don't think that uh, they, 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 there is any constraint on intertextual. Because in any case, you can't constrain it. It's, you see, intertextuality is not plagiarism. 
you deal with plagiarism very harshly, and, and, and you should. And that actuality happens whether you like it or not. Because, as I said here, yeah, you know, taxes talk among themselves as they meander through the ages, whether you like it or not. Some of these texts have never met, but they will talk. You see that? Because the, the discourses themselves that inform those texts are there. Uh, 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 you see. In fact, a lot of the programs that I've seen myself, students are, you know, especially writing programs, they are un encouraged actually to read very, quite, I mean, extensively what are known, I mean, models, you know, there, there, are, there are those models, you know, that um, we'll be discussing. So we discuss both their work, but at other times, we discuss, you know, uh, other established writers uh, and, and, and all that. And sometimes we may even say you create a pastiche of this or that, you know. Um, and it is something that you cannot uh, fight against, even if you wanted to, you see, because it, it just happens uh, 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 naturally in the creative process. I have a meeting, but thank you so much. Thank you, thank, thank you. So you. Yeah? Okay. okay. Can... Yes. Um, thank you for coming, and I really appreciated this idea of contextuality and how it sort of comes up naturally or accidentally. I'd love to hear more about your... Or purposely, you know. Mm -hmm. I say sometimes it's by design. Yes, yes. For instance, if, if you read a writer like J.M. Kozien, you read his novel, Faux. You find intertextuality with Daniel Defoe's De De life, but Daniel Defoe's work as well, Robinson Crusoe and Roxanne, on the other hand. Mm -hmm. You see, the writer consciously and purposely uses these and hopes that you are going to identify them. In other words, he's not stealing them. Right. He hopes you are going to identify them and that they will enrich then your experience of, of you see. Yeah. But then, you know, that's, that was not your question. Oh, I... <laughs> yes. I, it kind of was my question. I'm interested in also your process. You spoke a lot about research and travel, and I'd love to hear more about sort of your actual writing process, how you put together these... I know you mentioned you sort of use the paintings as inspiration for your characters. Um, but how you sort of put together these historical novels and where the ideas come from. Okay, with historical novels, because I write both historical and just contemporary stuff, you know. <coughs> with historical novels, yes, I do some research, you know. And my historical novel is, is, is quite different from other historical novels that I've seen where the writer tries to subvert history and managed to do it very beautifully, actually. I, I, I do love those novels as well, the subvert, you know. Um, with, with mine, you see, the intention is not to, to subvert history, but is to use historical record as it exists at this time, knowing, of course, it, it, it's, its problems, <laughs> you know, you see. Uh, to locate my stories within that, you see. And when I do that, it's because, you see, why I do that is because there are many, there's a lot of rich history in South Africa that my people have not been allowed to, to study, you see. They are they're only, they have to study history from the, the, the white master's perspective and their history, you know, how they came to South Africa and so on and, so on, and all that. Whereas people have been making history all along. You see that? And a lot of it is there. You know, there's historical record, but there's also the oral tradition, there are oral traditions and, 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 and so on. You know, um, there are genealogies that are recited. You know, I know my history, for instance, from you know, 500 years ago 
from the person who left uh, Central Africa, the Great Lakes, and came down, and then to whom he gave birth, and then he, and so on and so on, and all that, up to my father and, uh, uh, and to myself, because we recite genealogies as part of what we are brought up with, you see. So poetry becomes the book of the ancestors, you see, through which they've recorded uh, their history. And then as it is passed from generation to generation, we add those generations, we add them until it gets, it gets down to me. So the oral tradition is very important, but historical record as well. Uh, so my aim really is, is not to subvert history, but to take historical record and so on and uh, bring it to the attention of, of my readers by fictionalizing. I always make the point that my fiction, my novels are driven by fictional characters. Otherwise, they would not be novels. I mean, if they are driven by, by historical characters. By, by fictional characters who come from my imagination, but then those characters function within that history. They operate within history. Sometimes they are impacted by that history, you see. Sometimes they are players in that history. You see that? Uh, so the, the research I do, that, that I do then, you know, uh, it involves a, a, a lot of talking with people and so on, the old ones who still have this culture of gene genealogies and, and, and all that. Yes. Mm. Yes. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, so you mentioned, uh, you were sort of talking about this just in the last question, but uh -huh. you mentioned the unintentional use of intertextuality, but how do you think your works may have been influenced had you read The Hard Darkness or The Jungle Book, or how, how do authors purposefully fully connect different texts? Well, I, I don't even know. I don't even know because with Heart of Darkness, actually, I... I have no idea what is in there. And where scholars write about it, you see, I, there's a lot of scholarship about my work. I don't read that scholarship. I never ever do. Some scholars have given me books that they've written on my work. I keep them there so that my kids can read them if, 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 if they want, to, they, 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 they want to, to read. But I, I, I never bother with them because, you see, they, they, they won't help me in anything. I've already created the work. You see that? And I don't intend to, in my next work to take advice from scholars how to create my next work. So th there's no point of, uh, of reading it. If I was going to teach my work, for instance, which I don't, maybe then I would be compelled to read it, to hear what other scholars are saying about it and so on. But I never, ever teach my work. Actually, I would not know how, you see. There are many things I say in my work that I didn't even know I was saying. I hear them from scholars. They say, oh, here, yeah, this is what you are saying. And so I say, oh, that's what I'm saying. That's wonderful. <laughs> you see that? So I have no idea. You see, it's impossible to answer that question because I have no idea. I do not think, for instance, you, you see, when they write you know, a, a, a work of great scholars, especially the Italians, there's a lot of work there on where, I mean, you know, they, they, they are looking at intertextuality between Heart of Redness and, and, and Heart of, of Darkness. Why I'm saying that scholarship is valid even though those texts have, have, have never met is because the circumstances and the discourses that have informed my work or inform that other work, you know, meander through, 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 through. And definitely, there's definitely going to be intertextuality of your work with some other work that you know nothing about. You see, whether you know it or not, whether you, you like it or not. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.